Good to see every one of you today. Glad that you've chosen to join us this morning. Let me take an opportunity, if I can, to challenge you to find in your Bibles 1 Timothy chapter 5. We'll be there in just a few moments. And, uh, and as you're finding your way there, let me just mention something that uh, is imperative to at least the timing of where, where we are as a church family. You know, we've seen an opportunity in the last while for uh, our church to begin expanding and seeing, seeing that happen uh, pretty rampantly. And part of the de- challenge that we have is parking. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bring up the next spot, if you would, please, uh, at the map. Um, we are get- endeavoring, our finance team, we've met with our finance team and walked through. We've got four different bids that we've walked through with that. And we've chosen a, a contractor to be able to actually repay, resurface our entire parking lot. It's falling apart. If you've been around it, you see some holes already. It's, uh, it's just not in good, uh, good repair. We need to be able to fix that. We will be expanding a little bit on the what would be the south lot. You can see some very dark areas right around those three islands, grass islands. We're expanding that a little bit so that better traffic flow can happen in those islands. Um, and we are also going to be able to mark off uh, those islands so that we can be able to have a, more, a better defined process of parking. Uh, we, that if, when we do this project, we'll end up with about 330 some odd spaces that will be available to us for parking. And, uh, so, uh, anyway, it it will help us to better navigate where we are today. We need to fix it. If you own a home, you know, things happen. And sometimes those matters of expenses are heavy. And this one is a heavy expense. We've got some irrigation issues actually in the South parking lot. Um, maybe if you've been out here, you, there's right beside this light pole. If you ever come in here after it actually irrigates, there's a pond out there, no matter whether it's rains or not, because we've got water that's coming up. We've got a broken pipe out there. We've got to actually cut the asphalt up to fix that. So, so there's some things we've got to do beyond that, some parking blocks, those concrete blocks and the like. But uh, we're just right at $300,000, excuse me, for the expense for that. And uh, in the back of your seats or in the front of the seats in front of you, every, every one of us, there are uh, envelopes that are available. We're just going to have to have you to help us, to be honest with you. We, if you've been here long, uh, you recognize we don't ever, hardly ever, ever, ever ask for money. But uh, in this particular situation, I think, think it's time for us to be able to at least come together and take a little bit of extra step if we can to be able to make this parking a reality for us. There are some other things that we are in the future some neat things happening. Our Spanish church, you know that, you've seen it, you've, you've experienced, you know Pastor Jose. It's growing and uh, there's going to come a time when we're going to have to, as a church family, come together and help them to figure out what the next step is. I mean, to be honest with you, and that's a neat, and that's a neat problem to have. And, and so uh, it's, it's exciting to see that. And uh, uh, this past week, uh, actually it was week, uh, I guess it was this past week, I had a conversation with a Brazilian young lady and she began to say she asked me she said would it be possible to do something in our church family for our Brazilian community and I said absolutely what are you thinking about and she talked about a gathering of, of just Brazilian folks that's uh, because they've got, apparently there's Brazilian meetings in Orlando and Tampa but nothing here in Polk County and I said well why not and I said what's your dream what's your long-term dream of that and she said well, I don't know. We need a place to meet. We need some opportunities for some fellowship. And I said, could you ever envision a Portuguese church? And she just grinned from ear to ear. And she said, absolutely. So who knows? You know, we pray. We need to have our hands open for what God will do in the days to come. Possibly us have an opportunity to invest into another language ministry in our church family. And I just consider that an honor. But in the short term... We do have a parking lot matter to address, and it's easy math. If 300 of us decide we'll write a check for $1,000, it's all taken care of. But you'll have to break it down beyond that, beyond that number. That, that's just the easy side for me. But anyway, thank you so much for hearing me and considering what God may lead you to do in the days and weeks to come. We've been in this series in, uh, in the book of First Timothy, and really First and Second Timothy, really this series on leadership, I uh, planned this series back in November of last year. It's neat to see how that, you know, God, if, if you know me very well, I love to plan ahead, at least in the sermon prep. And uh, so I'm, uh, I've, I've, we, this was planned back. I could not have articulated how this whole thing would have some particular application, how it is today. 
but I believe it would be fitting for us to at least tack- tackle the passage of Scripture today that we had planned back in November. And I believe that passage would lead us to understand something about leadership as it relates to this whole concept of our responsibility and ultimately as a church family as well as us as leaders. And so I'd love for this morning, if we can, to uh, sort of look at this text together. Let me mention to you as we think about that as well, Timothy has already given to us sort of a platform of what it would be like or what it should be like in our lives. He's writing to Timothy, who's ultimately been called to come alongside the church at Ephesus to help, th- help navigate them through some difficult waters that they were in. And in the process of time, he, he gives, them a, gives them some understanding that their whole premise is really as a church body, if they are the household of God, they're the family of God, and their whole premise is to be able to be the foundation or the pillar and foundation of the truth. We saw that a few weeks ago, saw that the person of Jesus Christ becomes the, 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 vo- the, f- the face of or the voice of truth in that regards, what we know and what we can understand, what we can see. And so he actually was, he's the way, the truth, and the life. We know that. But as Paul would write even to Timothy, he would write and say to him, as it, as it relates even to your life and into the life of the church family, we need to call each other. We need to call to a place where we grow up in godliness. And that's what it needs to look like. In a world today, in our world today, who finds itself all over the place, having all kinds of difficulties around us, they're longing for, the world needs a place where they can actually look at and see and recognize there's something uniquely different with the people of God. And God rise calls us to rise above the norms of society to do something far greater than what ultimately they would see across the college campuses, for instance, today. You know, we're seeing today how, how college campuses re- deal with difficulty or challenges or disagreements, right? You're seeing the Palestinian groups raise up all over the place to voice and raise their voices up so that everybody can hear. And we're just seeing it's sort of a mess that's ha- taking place. Well, is that the way we as a church family handle those things? Is that the way we should handle those things? Absolutely not. And I think Paul talks to Timothy regarding this particular area in our lives that we might be able to find a way to reflect what Jesus has for us rather than reflect what the world sees with everyone else. Three things as I look at this passage and I sort of think about the circumstances that find ourselves here today. Number one is this. I'm, I'm convinced today that God's sovereign, God is sovereign or his sovereignty is seen all around us, even as it relates to timing. Again, I can't tell you how it all, how it all works out. We couldn't have planned all where we are today and this whole, this whole concept of life and circumstances. But in reality, back in November, God knew ahead of time where we would be. And he, need, he, he had a word for us. And the reality was we simply need to be obedient to what God has to say. And the beautiful thing in this whole journey is that uh, we were three weeks out from the end of this series, and uh, y'all don't know this, don't, probably didn't need to know this, but uh, we're three weeks out, and I'm still scratching my head as of, as of Sunday of last week of what are we going to do. I have no idea. There's been like a spiritual block that I've had. I could not find a way to plan ahead. And the neat thing about it is Monday and Tuesday this week, and, and with everything else going on, <laughs> I have, I have a sermon outline scheduled all the way through the beginning of 2025 now. The, free, the freedom that God has given to us in the midst of where we are today has been astounding. And I just want to say glory to God in the process of it all. Because he is indeed sovereign over the affairs of our world and over the affairs of our life and over the affairs of the church. And I'm really convinced that's the case today. And, uh, but we'll, we'll move on from that point. I also understand today that God has defined character traits for us as followers of Christ that we would ultimately live out. We talked about these particularly last week as we looked at 1 Timothy 3 and looked at the, the, the rising up the, of the church leaders and the character traits that, that we were identified with. And, and you're welcome to go back and listen to that series, that message from last week. But at the bottom line, I want to simply say this, is that God expects you and I as followers of Christ to reflect something different than what we see in the world. The reality is when difficult times comes our way, we have the privilege to either allow the fruit of the Spirit to flow through us. If we walk in the Spirit, His Spirit's going to flow through us, or we're going to see things that look more like the world or fleshly kinds of things, Right? Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23 says, in our difficulties, we need to find and understand that we either have an opportunity to reflect and respond to things with love and joy and peace, gentleness, kindness, those kind of things, 
Or we have an opportunity, as Galatians 5 would say previous to that, that we have an opportunity to, to live out or to express the more fleshly kinds of things that are clear, he said in verse 19, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcerers, hostility, quarreling, outburst, a jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and, and other sins like this. And he gives us this list, which is not a complete list, but what he's giving to us is a defined list of what the natural man lives out and what the godly man lives out, right? How we function in this society, how we, how we respond to the circumstances in our society, in large parts it's going to be defined by the character that has been developed within us because of our walk with Christ. We're either going to look like Christ or we're going to look like everybody else. And how we respond to those things in life ultimately gives to, us, gives to the world a, a, a set of watching eyes, an understanding of whose we really are. Paul has told Timothy, we need to focus upon the journey of training ourselves to be godly, where, thereby we might find a way in the process of life to be able to, to live out and reflect and respond to, to those, those stimuli around us in a way that would ultimately reflect the person of Jesus Christ, because that's who we've been called to emulate. There's a third thing I want to mention to us as well this morning as we sort of walk through this whole journey. I, I, I want you to understand, and I know, and we all know this, the dangers of slanderous words. Those words that come, you know, I oftentimes think about a marriage relationship and I've had many opportunities through the years to minister to and care for and love on families who have gone through difficulties and it's, it's oftentimes easy for us to hear, hear them talk about the challenges, you know, and, but oftentimes the challenges that they deal with are not the words that said. You know, you know Sally says, you know, uh, he spent $50 last year, and I, $50 last week, and I knew nothing about it. And we just had a knockdown, drag out fight about that $50. Well, if you were to peel that onion back a little bit, you're going to find in that conversation that, that that conversation probably started with those $50, but it ended with character assassinations. You always, or you all, you know, whatever, there's something that moves beyond the ash issue of the whatever the issue is into the place that we actually find a way to begin to destroy the person rather than to deal with the issue. And that's what happens in life. It happens to all around us. Slanderous words are part of the enemy's arsenal, I believe, to divide. Whatever God has joined together, let what? No man put asunder. And the real losers, let's just assume it this way, this couple, Sally and her husband, whoever that might be, is finding themselves arguing and bickering over the $50 that were spent, and they're screaming and, 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 and saying all kinds of ugly words to each other, and their children are sitting back on the background listening. Who are the real losers in this battle? Who are the, who are the winners? Well, obviously, Sally or her husband said, boy, I, got, I won that one. <laughs> I set him straight, or she could say, he, he could say, I set her straight. But look at the damage that comes to the kids, those who are watching. And as it relates to those times that we face ourselves sometimes in conflict, even in, 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 the, in the community of faith, we need to understand that the real losers in this effort are the lost, those who have never met Jesus Christ as their Savior, as they look upon a church and I look upon a Christian community that says, this is the way we handle things in life. And they say, well, that's no different than everybody else in the world. We look upon those who are, have, will be offended by what takes place and ultimately may never return to God's church. So it's with that context this morning that I'd like for us to look at this passage together today. And when we look at this passage, I believe this passage gives to us just a brief outline, three points this morning if we can as Paul writes to Timothy and challenges Timothy to be able to rise to the occasion and help the church at Ephesus to do better than they're doing currently. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says these words, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him. The word rebuke there that we find in, that, in the context is the word to strike upon or to beat with. The idea is to strike or to beat with words. The idea here is the, the, to chastise or to chide or to abra, abrade or to rebuke. 
contrast of that, do not rebuke an older man, but rather to encourage him. The word encourage is actually the word parakeleo. It actually accept, it means someone who's been called alongside of. As we look at the paradigm and think, sort of think about it, and we've been talking about this for the last several weeks of where we sense God's leading us in the, in the life and ministry of the church is, is, is to this place where we as a community of faith come to the place where we actually all embrace somebody and walk, to get, walk this faith out journey with somebody through mental relationships. And I know that's a whole new dynamic for many of us, and I, I look forward to I probably have not been as excited about anything I've ever done in ministry than what, what, we're, what we're embarking upon. But I'm looking forward to that opportunity for us to walk together through this journey of life. The problem is, as we find ourselves in this, in this life, is so many times words that said ultimately bring about a sense of wedge or a sense of divide or difficulty that, that comes in, in a relationship. And all, that, 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 unless there's some kind of a, a, intervention, many times there's not a re- restoration of that. But we need to be careful as a Christian community, as a community of faith, to be able to find ourselves to the place where we ultimately guard ourselves with the words of slander. This passage, I believe, verses 1 and 2, speaks to us specifically regarding this point. God honoring ministry, I believe, requires genuine respect for everyone. Genuine respect for everyone. You know, 1 Peter 1, verses 2 and 7 gives to us a 17, it gives to us an idea of the word, this word, this idea of respect. This passage encourages us to, to talk about and, and to live out respect, at least in particular areas of our life, for everyone, for other Christians, for God, and even for those in authority. Respect has been called to be given to everyone. I, I should, said this in the first service, and I say it again today. My dad was probably the wisest man I've ever known. I, I love him. He was, I was born late in his life. He was 58 when I was born, and, and uh, he, he had gone to the fourth grade in school. That's all he got to. He didn't finish the fourth grade, actually. His, his father died when he was in the fourth grade. He was born in 1904. That predates most of us today. But he was born in 1904, and uh, in those days, he had, he had an older brother and two younger brothers, and in those days, the oldest basically dropped what they were doing went to the farm to fix, to make sure the farm carried on so that the younger children could act, actually have a life. And ultimately, the rest of his two younger brothers finished school. The older, oldest brother and him never finished school. But that didn't hinder him. He became a very successful man, understood math. He was a math whiz, and he, he did not go beyond the fourth grade. And it's, it's amazing to see that. But one of the things he oftentimes sa- said re- regarding life and about people, he, often, he always said something like this, every man deserves dignity. And what I saw how it lived out in his life was my dad, my dad would, we'd, we'd be in bed. I was, I, was a, I was a shy young man. If somebody knocked on our front door, I would, I would run and hide underneath the bed. But at nighttime, sometimes 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, we'd hear a knock on our door. And there would be somebody coming out of the local bar, actually, that's too drunk to get to wherever they needed to be or whatever it possibly might be. <laughs> or there would be a balloon that just falls from the sky. And, uh, but he would be too drunk to be able to find a way to be able to navigate to the steps ahead. And so in reality, it was... My dad would actually step out and take that person home. Didn't matter what, who they were, didn't matter their skin color, none of that mattered. And I oftentimes used to hear him say, as, as many times he would find himself sort of defending his action to his, to his wife, my mother. She would say, Marcus, why do you do that? And he would all times say, every man deserves respect. No matter who they are, no matter what they've done, every man deserves respect. And that's the way he lived his life. And I really believe when we look at the context of this passage, when it says to us that don't rebuke an older man, encourage him as a, fa- as a father, younger men, don't, as, treat them as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, and all in purity. And we need to understand, I believe this passage is giving to us instructions to the churches how, how we actually respond and we treat each other. And that's ultimately bound up in this concept of respect. Second thing, the largest part of this passage 
has to do with this whole ins- issue of, of what it is God has called us to do as a church family. And here particularly, he's talking to us about how our, our mandates has been given to us as it relates to the widows and caring for those who are needy. Passage, I believe, gives to us starting in verse 3 and following, sort of give us an understanding of what our ministry mandates are, as well as some imposed boundaries within those ministry mandates. Part of the passage deals with what we should do, and the other part of the passage deals with how we should guard ourselves or protect ourselves in those areas as well. We do know contextually, and we'll get into the text in just a second, God's called us to preach the gospel to all nations, right? Acts 1 8, when you receive, when, when, when I leave, you'll see, see the power of the Spirit of God's going to come upon you. You have a responsibility to Jerusalem, your local community, to, Jer- to Judea, to Samaria, and also to the rest of the world. So there's a responsibility we have in carrying the gospel of Christ to all the boundaries of the world. We have a responsibility because we're believers in Christ. God is gifted to us, spiritually gifted to all of us, and we, we've been given a responsibility to exercise our spiritual gifts in a way that would honor Him. Even so much so that even Isaiah would say, how beautiful are the feet of those who, go to the, who, who bring the gospel of Christ. Galatians chapter 6 would remind us that if, if, if anyone's in a, taken in a fault, what do we do? We, we go and we help him or her up. But the passage goes on to say, and all the while, while we have a mandate to help them up, we also have a boundary to protect ourselves from being tripped up like him. Here's where I understand that passage. Let me, let me just, let's just read this passage together, starting in verse 3. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and make some return for their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. In other words, if, you, if, a, if a child or if a, a set of children have a parent Mom or dad, I think this probably could apply to either one of them particularly. But anyway, speaking to widows here, the the partner passes away. The responsibility in large part lies to the children to make sure that their parents are taken care of. That's part of that honoring your father and your mother. That's that's obvious to say, right? Verse 5, she who is truly a widow left alone has her hope set on God and continues in supplication and prayer night and day. But she who is self-indulgent and dead, even while she lives, command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own relatives, especially for the members of his own household, has denied the faith and is worse than what King James would say, even an infidel or an unbeliever. We have an opportunity, I think, in this passage to remind ourselves of the obligations, responsibilities of family to care for our aging parents. Many of us have done that and, or, in, or in the process of doing that today. We've seen that lived out. And ultimately, that's our responsibility. But he, but he gives to us an understanding that possibly you may find a widow that has done her life, lived her life well, has no children, and then where, what happens to her? I believe the imposition, imp, what's imposed here or inferred in this passage of Scripture is that, that the church has a responsibility as well to take care of them as well. We have an opportunity. opportunity. Verse 9 goes on to say, let a widow who be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age. In other words, those who are giving up sort of a timeline, break line, 60 years of old, old age of an older needs to be a part, need to be considered a widow who might be taken care of. The wife of one husband, given sort of a character background of her, having a reputation for good works if she's brought up children and has shown parts of hospitality, has washed the feet of saints, has cared for the inflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. In other words, if 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 a lady has devoted her life into ministering for others, she deserves ministry. But the contrast, verse 11 and following, goes this way. But refuse to enroll a younger widow. For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having been abandoned, abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not say. So I would, not have, I would have younger widows rather marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some, he said, have already strayed from Satan, strayed after Satan, But then he comes back to this passage. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let them care for her 
Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly in need. It's a challenge for all of us. We have opportunities so many times in life to sort of walk through and try to figure out how to, how to best help people. And sometimes, our, you know, I've had, I've had to apologize to our staff so many times. We'll have somebody from, from Georgia, for instance, call, tell us this story. Was it a true story? I don't really know. It may, be, it may have been absolutely honest, but they'll call from Georgia and they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm here and this is a bad situation. Life is tough and I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm destitute, getting ready. Whatever, whatever's happened, they've got this story that we, we've been called upon and then we've got to measure how we respond to that. And so many times our staff has had to say, isn't there a church close by? Why are you calling Florida to help you while you're in Georgia? Uh, you know, the cycle sort of looks like possibly that they've probably run out of the resources that's possible that they could get around them, and now they're just reaching. I, we don't know. I'm, I'm not judged. I can't judge that. But so oftentimes, the words that come after that are sort of something like this. This is my story, and since you're a Christian or a church, you ought to help me. There's a sense of imposed guilt to motivate us then to do some kind of benefit for them. And when we find ourselves sort of saying, you know, I, I'm sorry, we cannot help you at this time, the next words come out of their mouth is usually not, thank you, Lord. They may use the Lord's name, but it's usually in vain. And I've had to apologize to our staff so many times because they get the blunt end of the stick when they actually say no to some people that are trying to find help and they're not even close by. So many times in life we find those opportunities, and it's hard for us to discern that always, but God has given us an opportunity and a responsibility to steward his resources, and we need to do our best to steward them well and to care for those who are justifiably in need, and we do that a lot. And then to discern when we can also say no, because I believe while we've been given ministry mandates, we've also been given boundaries within those mandates, and we need to discern how we best use, utilize ourselves. So many times in life, I've I, I found myself, I, I'm, a, I'm a people pleaser by nature. That's who I am. And I find myself so many times in life wanting to do things because I want people to like me or whatever it might be. So many times people sort of use that against me, knowing that that's a weakness on my part, and they'll imply that, you know, you need to do this, and if you were this, you need to accomplish this. And so many times I, there's something inside of me that wants to do everything people ask me to do. But I'm learning and I'm still growing in this area. There's sometimes in life I cannot do everything. I've said this statement sort of underneath that statement, that underneath that outline is this, or that outline point is this, is, we all have a responsibility, but everybody's responsibility is not my responsibility. And I've got to find a way to be able to balance that and find a way to be able to do what we can in the moment to be able to move forward and, and not serve the God of obligation, but rather serve and fulfill the gifts and the talents and, and the purposes for which God has called me. And we all need to do that as a church family. We've been given a ministry mandate, but I believe we've also been given some boundaries in that, and Paul talks about that in Timothy. Third thing I want to say in this passage, I think, and this is probably the hardest thing for me to say, has to do with, with how we treat and how we respond to our leader. This passage sort of wraps up here with talking about the need for us to respect, to protect, and to be an accountability for those who stand in leadership. I know what giftings God's given me, and I understand that, but this passage gives to us a comp, a, 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 some direct information, some direct instruction for us as a church family of how we do that. Verse 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says you should not mu muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and, and the laborers deserves his, or his wages. So, so there's, a, there's a command for us to demonstrate and care for. And I, 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 I said this early service and I want to say this again. You as a church family has done that so exceptionally well for us. You all have taken great care of us and we are honored 
to be a part of this church family. I, it's, I can't say that. 20 years ago, one of, the com- one of the conversations that happened when we first came here, by the way, this past, past week, I got the opportunity to celebrate my 20 year, 20 year anniversary. And, 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 and no, 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 I, I don't need that. But, uh, but in the process of time, I, 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 rem- I reflected back upon what Com- Karen and I talked a lot about when we first came here. I believe if there's any place I've ever served, there's no place that's ever demonstrated respect for leadership as you have. And I really believe that's why God has continued to bless the, bless the efforts. And, I, and I, I want to commend you for the way that you have demonstrated respect to us. And I appreciate that so very much. But not only should we respect, we also have been commanded to protect our leaders as well. Listen to what it says. Do not admit a charge. The word charge is the word accusation. That the, word, the word accusation simply means that the, the some, 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 something that someone's been accused of, it's, it's sort of the idea, sort of the same word that's used in Luke chapter 6, verse 7, when the scribes and Pharisees chose to watch him being Jesus closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day so that they might find a reason for accusation against him. Paul says to Timothy, be careful that you help them to help, help the church to understand, to not admit, not listen to, not hear, not give, God, not give space to a charge uh, against your elder, but rather on the evidence of two or three witnesses. In other words, the difference between an accuser and a witness is the witness was there. The accuser is someone who's bent up with maybe some emotions or something, but the ra- reality is they weren't present. Listen to those who were there present. Jesus, as, as, as he stands trial before Pilate in Mark 15, sort of the same concept. He said, very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers, the religious law, the entire high council met to discuss their next step. What are we going to do with this guy named Jesus? They bound Jesus, laid him away, took him to Pilate, the Roman governor, and Pilate asked, are you the king of Jews? Jesus replied, that's what you said. Then the leading priests began to jump in. We've got some things we want to say, accusing him of many crimes. And Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer them? Aren't you going to speak up? What about those charges they're bringing against you? But Jesus, you know what he said? He said, nothing. Much to Pilate's surprise, why did he not defend himself? The reality is he didn't need to. His responsibility was to fulfill the, path, the thing that God has called him to do. And he said, he, he said, I've come to do my Father's will. And in the process of time, whatever accusations may, meet, may be made against me as, a, as, as, as the Savior of the world is, is said in the context of the way that I've chosen to live my life before you all for the last three and a half years. You know, one of the verses, I've, and I've shared this with you last week as well, but one of the verses that continue to be, to be impressed upon my heart and I've sought to live after is when people live in such a way, 1 Peter 3, 16, that when people speak all manner of evil against you, they'll be proven wrong by the way you live your life. Do, do we make mistakes? You better believe it. The sad thing about it is I'm probably more honest about those mistakes sometimes than I should be. Y'all know about my driving in 27 and I-4 in Lake Cannon last week. Been honest about all those things. Do we make mistakes? Yes. The question is, what's the character that you see, that you observe, that you don't see for a moment, that you don't see a glimpse of, but you see and observe for the long period of time? That needs to be the test. You know, I, I, my, my wife and I, when we, when we first stepped into ministry, you know, that one of the things that we struggle with in many ways is this whole concept is a pastor, you live in a glass house. And y'all have heard that. But I've never pushed back away from that. I don't need to. Because in some ways, that glass house is the accountability that I need for you all. And so as, as it relates to this concept, we have been challenged by the word of God to have respect for and also protect our leaders. And yet, the passage goes on to say we need accountability as well. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest of us may stand in fear. 
In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudice, doing nothing from partiality. Don't be hasty in laying on of hands nor take part in the sins of other people. In other words, keep yourself pure. The process of it all, there, there, we all need, need accountability. We all need to stand and, and account, a, a, accountable before us. And so in the process of life, we need, as our leaders, we need for our leaders to be able to respect them, protect them, and also be have them to be accountable to us as well. And the summary of this is found for us in verse 24 and 25 because what we do know is the sin of some people are conspicuous. In other words, it's obvious. It's it's, it's, Everybody sees it, going before them to judgment. But the sin of others that's hidden will ultimately appear later. And what do we know? What What does Scripture teach us? Scripture teaches us very clearly that you can hide things for a while, but God tends to always bring stuff out in the open, right? Is that not true? So there is some commands we have regarding our leaders, and we've been called, I think, to fulfill his commands. Here's what, I, here's what I know about this passage. I'd love to be able to say to Timothy, I'd love to be able to say Timothy's work and effort was successful. But was it? You know, Paul wrote to Timothy. Remember the context of the passage. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he's writing to him in First and Second Timothy because Paul has called Timothy to come alongside a church in Ephesus to be able to help them to navigate through some difficult days. We know Timothy was there, and there were other church leaders in that day that come alongside of Timothy and helped him in that process. And I'm sure there was great effort toward doing that. And, and the bottom line, did it work? Well, we'd have to look at history to tell us that. We know, we know the book of Ephesians was a, is a great book, and we find a great deal of opportunity for, from that. It's a, it's a book that uh, has, a, has a whole doctrinal section to it. It teaches us great doctrine, the first few, few three chapters of that, and verses, ch- verses, chapters 4 and 5 and 6 helps us to understand how to live that out in life. But, but the reality is, even with a book written from uh, Paul, from Paul regarding the church at Ephesus or to the church at Ephesus, was it successful? We'd have to turn our Bibles open a few pages over to the end of the book and read in Revelation chapter 2. John was called to write to the, a letter to seven churches that most of them had been birthed by the Apostle Paul. And uh, John wrote, and he wrote to the churches, and he would tell them some things that they were doing well and some things they weren't doing well and and sort of giving them insight as to their impact in the world. And, and while they were historical churches, I believe it also speaks to us even a couple, a couple of millennia later of, of some things that we need to sort of guard ourselves from and protect ourselves in. So we write to Ephesus, and Revelation chapter 2 tells us in, in Ephesus that, uh, you know, I've, I've taken opportunity, Jesus said, to look at your work, to look at your life, and to be able to see what's going on. And I've been able to notice some things about your life. And it says to us here in Ephesians chapter, uh, excuse me, Revelation 2, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, right? The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. I know how you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who call themselves to be apostles and they have not measured up. And found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up underneath uh, underneath for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. You've kept doing and doing and doing and doing. You've not given up. But John writes, Jesus invites, challenges, motivates, inspires John to write these words to the church at Ephesus. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. The bottom line is they found themselves in a position where they were no longer, as one translation says, no longer were they loving God like they used to, nor were they loving each other like they used to. In the context of life, in the context of where we find ourselves today, even in this journey that we find ourselves in today, in the application, I think it would be helpful for us to at least notice a couple of things. Number one, I want you to look around. It's okay, your neck will not break if you turn it, I promise you. 
I want you to look around. See the people that's standing, sitting close to you, sitting people far away from you, sitting on the other side of the church from you. You're all looking at me. I'm not sure why you're looking at me. Look around. I want you to consider the person that may be sitting here or maybe not be sitting here that aggravates you the most. Harold, be careful where you're looking. I think he's looking back at Gene Smart. But anyway, I want you to know that person is not your enemy. Our common enemy wants us to put names and faces to those people. But they're not your enemy. And as we navigate these days, we need to pray because we are family. Last thing I'd like to say this morning, and I've, I've asked this question at the end of every message, is how will you spend the rest of your life? How will you spend it? Well, we've, we've talked about that and spending it helping the process of life to be able to move on, to be able to make sure we fulfill our mission, we, to be able to be, rise up to the occasion, to become the men and women God's called us to be. But how will you spend the rest of your life? But will you determine to understand that God's great bride sits in these seats? We are the bride of Christ. And as Jesus said to the husband and wife, whatever God joins together, let no man put asunder, he says to the church as well. And I think I need to be reminded, and we all need to be reminded of this, will we determine, put that slide back up if you would, please, because I can't remember that well. Will we determine that we'll never be caught up in trying to determine that I'm right so much so, or that I, I find, or my rights, trying to defend my rights, so much so that I will take God's church and destroy his church for my cause. My challenge to us today is simply that, that we would rise to the occasion that we would be men and women that God has called us to be, that ultimately we would not display the works of the flesh but we would display the fruit of the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pause today to say thank you for your love and grace. Take our time this morning, even as we bring our, this service to an end. And as we worship this morning and celebrate the fact of what you have done for us, may you draw us to the place where we will determine to reflect you in the world no matter the cost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.